the expression of the streets. I'd drop a dime on him. I'd put a 10 cent stamp in an envelope, put his name and address on it, and drop it in the mailbox. Somebody will take it up from there. But you have to do it. If somebody did it to me, I wouldn't be here talking to you like this. I have a father who's still living. I have a mother who's still living. Do you think this is easy for me? My name is splashed all over the papers. I'll be on TV, national network. Do you think they like it? They don't like it, but they're proud of me now. And with their old European wisdom, they said, well, your name was splashed all over the papers every time you got busted. You know, at least now your nose is clean and you're doing something. And this is how I kind of feel. Maybe I'll use the word missionary. If I can make an impression on one, just one of you kids that's here, that's really all I want. Because if somebody somewhere had made an impression on me, maybe, I, you know, I wouldn't have done it. Now, I was talking at Norland High. And you know what? In an auditorium that had 2,500 seats, in a school that had almost 3,000 students, and I assume every one of these students had at least one parent, 50 parents showed up. They didn't give a damn about their kids. And you know something? I really, you know, maybe I'm saying the wrong thing. I don't expect too much of you kids. How the hell can they expect you to care when your mother and father don't care? And they have to care because they're the ones that have to recognize it. And I know you all talk. Sure, you hear, they're taking dope. Their pupils are pinpoints. They're on the nod. They're hanging over there. They're, their nose is down to the floor. That's fine. You're taking morphine or you're taking heroin. But what about the mother who says, I don't believe it. I told my daughter to do the bedroom and she's cleaning the whole house. Isn't this marvelous? She's just abounding with energy. Well, nine chances out of ten, she's abounding with methadrine, speed. Dizoxin, amphetamine, cocaine, these are exhilarants. And if a mother is looking for pinpointed pupils, she won't find them. She'll find big, black, dilated pupils. But if she doesn't know, what can she do about it? If a kid comes home and says, Mama, I'm sleeping over Jack's house, and Mama calls up and he's not at Jack's house, so what? So he comes home and says, Oh, Mama, I, I, I said Jack, but I really meant Jim. Well, he's not telling the truth. He was out getting high, stealing a car, laying out on the beach, smoking pot. And to use an old Jewish cliche, from this comes the worst diseases. Nobody can get away with it. And you say, I repeat, be a rat fink. How the hell can I be a rat fink? How can I get my friend picked up? Why can't you get your friend picked up for psychiatric help? If you don't get him picked up today, next year he's going to be busted. And you know what? In Florida, for instance, where I am now, it is a mandatory five-year sentence in the penitentiary for possession of one stick of pot. Now, they say, if you legalize it, that would take away the intrigue. That would take away the cabal, you know, the black market. It isn't so. You know what you have in England? It's legalized there. So you have people standing online waiting for the, the drugstore to open up. And what do they do there? They open up, they sell them the stuff, and they go into the park, like Washington Park or Gramercy Park, and they sit there in broad daylight fixing a shot and taking it, and in front of them is five little kids, maybe two, four, six, and eight. Mister, what are you doing? So here you're going to grow into a society of kids who have been exposed to mainline narcotic shooting from the time they were able to walk. What can they possibly grow into? All of you people who say, LSD, okay, if you're emotionally stable, you know, it, it doesn't give you a bad trip. It's a lie. I was thrown from a horse and I had a laminectomy and I ended up in the San Francisco General Hospital. I was operated on by the same doctor who operated on the late Jane Mansfield's son, Zoltan, when he was mauled by the line. Well, while I was there, they brought in a straight B student, 21-year-old, girl from the University of Southern California. She was part Negro, part Spanish, and part Indian. And believe me, she had the beauty of all three. Well, when I saw her, she was in the psychiatric ward. She had taken a trip on LSD, and it was devastating. They committed her to the psychiatric ward on the sixth floor. One of her college buddies came to visit her and bought her a cube of sugar, which had LSD in it, and she decided to escape. The avenue of escape she used was to go out the sixth floor window. How was she going to do that? She took one sheet, and even on a king-size bed, I'm sure you all have an idea of the length of a sheet, 
With that length, she had to tie it to the bedpost, and she lowered herself out the sixth floor. So, of course, she dropped five stories. When I saw her, she was on a striker frame. If any of you remember when Kennedy broke his back, it looks like a long spit. Your head is held immobile by two ice prongs, your feet are tied by traction, and every two hours they turn you over. This girl's neck was broken in six places. Now, they, I found out since that they fused her spine and her neck, and she will always be stiff, but it doesn't make any difference because she is a raving maniac, and her prognosis is nil. Now, this is LSD. And I know doctors, and I know lawyers, and I never know the most stable people in the world that have taken trips on LSD and are still waiting to return. Now remember that well, please. And you must forgive me, I talk off the top and if something comes to my mind, I repeat it. Let me repeat something to you that I know every one of you kids will identify with. Damn it, I did this, or damn it, I did that. My older brother was always bugging me. My sister was always bugging me. My mother and father were always telling me what to do. So great, rebel. By all means, rebel. And start using pills. Start using goofballs. Start using marijuana. Start using horse. And then go to jail. And then you know what? You go into a place like I went to, Rayford, Florida State Penitentiary, where you're thrown into a sardine can, where you eat and you sleep and you mess on the floor and you lay naked for male and female guards to check up on you. And in the morning, because the smell is ridiculous, they hose you out with a power hose. You're told when to eat, what to eat, how to eat, and what do you eat? Beans and, 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 and cornbread in the afternoon, coffee and, and, and grits in the morning, and rice and hogshead cheese in the night, every day from Monday to Sunday. This is what you get. You have no pride, you have no respect, you're stripped of every vestige of anything that you were given by God. Is that what you want? That's what you'll get. You can't get away with it, because I repeat, I'm pretty smart, and I couldn't get away with it. And I am trying my darndest to go all over the country. I work, I work for $52 a week in a house for retarded children, because my thing now is I have to help people. I was helped, and I'll tell you how I was helped. I was in the house of detention right here doing a six-month sentence for being an habitual user. Well, I did my five months and I think 20 days, and I was being released the following week. I looked outside, you know, you see 10th, 10th Avenue or 6th Avenue in Greenwich, and I said, good God, I have to go out in the street and come up against all these squares, maybe get in a cab or get in a, a bus or a taxi and see these damn squares, and I'm not going to be high, I can't do it. So I sent out to my connection, I said, would you please meet me with a shot? I can't make the street scene with the squares, I got to be loaded. I was a good customer, you know, $185 a day habit, so he met me in the rotunda of the house of detention with a shot. I went into the phone booth, and right through my dress, I took that shot. Unfortunately, one of the matrons wanted to make a phone call, and she walked in and busted me. And without ever hitting the street, I was rearrested and got another six months as a user. So there I was doing a year without ever hitting the street. Well, uh, I don't say God is dead. I only say that for many, many years we weren't on speaking terms. But this particular day, somebody was up there and he happened to like me because he, while I was looking for something else in a, in a magazine, I stumbled on Synanon. And then that man upstairs who liked me finally gave me a little tip and booted me. And I wrote a pathetic letter saying I'm 46 years old, been coming to jail for 18 years, been using stuff for 23 years. Obviously I need help. Obviously I can't help myself. Won't you please help me? The lawyer for Synanon came into the house of detention and February 11th, 1964, when I was released. There are many clinics here. They are all imitations of Synanon. If you kids go in and find out what it's all about, because all the people there have in one way or another identified with me. They can help you. You kids need help. I assume this is your teacher. Don't be afraid. She's only there to help you. Tell her. Get up enough moxie to go and say, I did something, I'm afraid, help me. Jail is not the answer. No prison hospital is the answer. Help, identification, 